what is what are we talking about? Of course, meditation is as natural as breathing. People have done meditation <laughs> since the beginning of time, haven't they? Um, you've only got to pause and just look about you, listen to the birds, look at the horizon. That little ditty I said to Phil before we started about being nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth, everybody knows that. You just step outside the door and you feel better, don't you? Open the window and you feel better. Have a wash, have a cup of tea and you feel better. All these things are meditation and very effective. Um, people have been uh, meditating without attaching that name to it. Always and always will. Um, it's always been associated with careful work. My mother loved to knit. She was always knitting. This is one of her old woolies. Quietly knitting by the fireside. That's some perfect meditation. Dad was an artist, he used to draw, always drawing. He'd be drawing now, just looking out the window, just drawing the shape of that little bush there. Immediately it brings you into the present, doesn't it? Because what is meditation? Primarily it's just bringing us into the present moment. So when you're attending to something, in a way the more precision the better, you're naturally in the present moment so that you don't make a mess of it, and you're meditating. You're taken out of your offer some thoughts, um, at least if you do what you're doing with more or less full attention, more attention the better, then it's more effective. So you're absolutely right. And uh, this is a bit of a newfangled word, meditation, really, at least in the West it is. I never heard of it until quite late on in life. It used to be called prayer. Um, I still don't know quite which word to use. <laughs> I don't know quite where one ends and the other begins, really. But um, meditation has just become the fashionable word recently, hasn't it? Um, it used to be called just common sense, didn't it? <laughs> Keep your feet on the ground. Attend to what you're doing. As Dad used to say to me, trying to teach me to bang a nail in straight. He said, watch the hammer, pay attention, then the nail will go in straight. And it does, amazingly. <laughs> if you don't pay attention, it goes crooked, doesn't it? What could be more simple? Well, <clears throat> but then, just to sort of make a bit more of an issue of it, Maggie, um, of there are levels. In all this spiritual work, we start off, we start off from where we are, and it's like going up into the sky. There are levels, and the higher you go up into the sky, the more you see. And it's just like that. So with meditation, there's this ordinary sort of common sense layer of meditation that just makes you feel better, a bit better maybe. And then there are other deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper levels ad infinitum which can be a sort of refinement of the basic common sense. And literally, the sky is the limit. And even that there, beyond the sky, there is such a thing, <laughs> beyond limit. Well, again, you, you're right. Um, and uh, yes, there, there's absolutely no use fighting thoughts, and you, you're not like to get rid of them either. Certainly not in that way. And I'm always a bit nervous about words like concentration, which uh, which implies a sort of something rather aggressive. Um, my favourite analogy about thoughts is clouds. Mm. You may have seen something I wrote, a long poem called Clouds. Well, so on a day like this, look, you look out of the window and it's just a, a grey, isn't it? But uh, you know, those of you that have ever been in an aeroplane, that beyond the grey is the blue sky. 
Well, thoughts are like clouds. Thoughts are really just a layer in the process of raising consciousness from the basic sort of street level, ordinary life, up to the highest level possible. We go through many layers. And just like up in the sky, thoughts occupy a layer, just like clouds do. You can be below the clouds, or you can be above the clouds. And very commonly, we are actually in the clouds. And this is what we call thinking. And there can be nice thoughts, or rather unpleasant thoughts, just like, you know, nice fluffy summer clouds, or dark threatening winter clouds. You know? So you get all sorts. But thoughts are just thoughts. They're really just, uh, without being too clever about it, just movements in the mind. Move like ripples in the sea, move currents in the sea. Mm? Um, consciousness, pure consciousness, is unchanging. So we can talk of it in terms of stillness, unchanging. God is unchanging. Mm? All right? Yeah. But within that changeability, within that unchanging aspect of pure consciousness, there are all sorts of movements. There's uh, uh, what you can call mental movement of thinking. Then there's come down into creation and it solidifies a bit and you get uh, what physical movement and what we call the, the, the movements of the world. But it's all held within this great stillness. The peace of God that passes understanding. And so in meditation we just have to they don't fight them. What are you fighting for? You just gently go through them. Like that. And then they're much more effective than, than, than trying to bully them into submission. It's just let go. Just let go like that. So simple, very gentle. And in letting go, you just, uh, like a balloon, once the balloon rise up, it just lets go the weights, doesn't it? Let go. Up we go. Thoughts are just thoughts. There's a golden rule about letting go. Letting go. Let go of whatever you can let go of. You see, do you just want the still, small voice of God, or do you want God Himself? If you get a glimpse, if you, if you get a glimpse of what you're talking about, smile and carry on. Be encouraged. <coughs> Let's come. Just come back here simply now in this room, feet on the floor, bottom on the chair. Just listen and look. So here we are just by those few simple gestures. We are present in this unchanging stillness, exactly the same as we experienced in the church. It's everywhere, all the time. And the pigeon is calling in it, and the earth's soaking in the rain, we're sitting here. The, the aeroplane up, up there somewhere. It all happens within this unchanging stillness, which you can also call a presence. And if you want, you can call it the presence of God. Just as the pigeon is calling within this presence, so we get all sorts of presentations, don't we? All sorts of things come on. Things arise in the mind. Is this it? What should I be doing more? Mm -hmm. Let's come back to simply being present.
say, these questions you're asking are contained, aren't they? We can smile at them, really. What happens to questions when we're just present? They rather fizzle out, don't they? Just pure and simple being. And if we start asking questions, we'll soon find that it takes us away from this. <laughs> we can, as it were, go back inside our heads. So, is this it? <laughs> Am I happy, or should I be happier? <laughs> um, the art really is in losing interest in results and just uh, this simple trust in letting go. Utter simplicity. No doubt, no question. Childlike innocence. Along comes a little thought, so what? A surprising answer given to us by the head of the tradition from which uh, I, I learned in a school of meditation from which uh, who guided the school. Um, somebody asked him what to do with these thoughts and that's what he answered. I tried to acquire the couldn't care less attitude towards them. So I know there are times when they're very, very strong, absolutely <laughs> tormenting us, driving us nuts, aren't they? Um, and of course, most of the world is feeding them all the time, isn't it? And if we watch the, you know, if we fill ourselves up with all the latest things on internet and the news and that, we can get completely swallowed up by it all. That's why it's so simple, so useful, just this simple, simple exercise of feet on the ground, bottom of the chair, just listen. Just look. Even in a big city, you can do it. And you find this, it absolutely seems miraculous when you first discover it, this mm -hmm. stillness is ever-present. Mm -hmm. It really, really is. Try it for yourselves and see. That's the one thing we have to do, is practice. If you just hear someone like me saying it, of course, if you understand it at the time, and five minutes later, you, you've lost it again. So we, we, we must, if you want to, if you really want to, um, find this unassailable, whatever you call it, we must practice. Come back here. Come on. Here and now. That's right, just feel the girls squeaking the sofa. Here and now. Now you took us away to your home. You told us about something that happened some time ago. And you lost the present, didn't you? You've been carrying this bit of rug luggage around with you for a long time. Hmm? And let it go. Come back here. You don't want to, do you? You see, there's resistance. People hang on to these things. It's surprising. You try and make some people come to the present, they won't. And very often when we talk about our suffering or some terrible event, we hold on to it like grim death, you know. We won't let go. It takes a lot of practice to come into the present. It's so easy, it's so natural. And yet we insist on 
holding on to these things, creating questions. Now then, real or not real? Well, you'll have to find out in your own experience, gradually, 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 over many years, which is more real. And the less real is superseded by the more real. But unless until you get experience of something better, you will continue to dwell in what you think is what your within your experience is the most interesting thing or something. It's work. It really is. This is work. If we wish to proceed along the spiritual path. Dreams are dreams, lucid dreams or not lucid dreams. They come and they go. Here now, this, what we're talking about, this stillness is ever present. That's better, we're getting a bit more of the taste of it now. And within this, all the wonderful, dreadful happenings of life take their place. And there's always a clue, because if you can describe them and, and give them name and form, you see, name and form, they are part of the performance. You see, stillness, this presence, is nameless and formless, and you cannot describe it. As we cannot describe God, what we call God. Anything that you can describe is not it. Whatever you can describe is part of the lower this you see you start off from the from the indescribable and 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 we rise and fall through these many levels of consciousness just like an aeroplane goes up and down you can't describe the upper limits of the sky it's just boundless isn't it pure freedom now, as you descend, you come into things that can be described, upper layers of the air, little wispy clouds, which we can begin to describe because they have a limit, they have a shape, they have a colour and a texture, and a, something that you can get your mind around, literally get our mind around so that we can produce words and descriptions. You see, and then that gradually descends down into the sort of further crystallization of what we call the world. Now then, meditation, or what this, what spiritual work is, the reverse process. Now, uh, oh, no matter how dramatic and compelling, um, these uh, uh, e events, happenings, they are part of the nature of the of pure being coming coming down into manifest performance. And we can get completely swallowed up by this, gripped by it, literally, consumed by it, trapped by it. And, of course, we love it. And particularly by the central uh, performer, which is what we call me, the ego, my dream, my lucid dream, my sorrow, my suffering. Hmm? This is what I saw. And yet here and now, come again into this. Pure, simple being. No claim. It isn't mine, it isn't yours. It isn't any body. It's singular in that we can smile at the performance, to let it go.
to these questions, we probably never get an answer to, not at that level. You get an answer because you come to see that what it is. That's the answer. Can you see that it's what it is? What's the question? It's just a lucid dream. We are told that, uh, that God calls us. What is it that calls us? What is it? You know how a compass always point north, won't it? It seems to me we have a sort of inner compass that... What does it ask for? When people... In the school where I was taught, when people came for their first interview, they were asked the question, what do you really want? What's your heart's desire? And people would give various answers for that. It's a good question to bear in mind. What do we really want? There is something in all of us, isn't there? Some deep sense of that we are incomplete and we need something love or freedom or meaning or something like that. Or maybe just this indefinable thing we call God. Of course the ego does get uh, mixed up in it inevitably, that's all right. Because the ego's you know, right next to us all the time. It's just like a you know, there's, there's this pure being and there's the ego, so it, of course it accompanies the journey all the way. Um, because the ego thrives on description, it's always looking for results. That's why we're warned or advised not to look for results, because that's always a projection of the ego. Just present here, feet on the floor. And let this completely unassuming, gentle presence just inform us. child gets completely tormented by some matter screaming its head off in her about something or other. What does a mother do or a father do? Just, oh, come on, Ducky just strokes his little head. Comfort, comfort her, isn't it? Oh, Jesus calls the presence, the spirit, the comforter. Comforter will give you all knowledge. Peace of God that passes understanding. To understand is to stand under. The peace of God that passes understanding. These questions are just not contained, are they? There's a famous book called The Pilgrim's Progress. I wonder if you probably don't know it in Holland. It's been translated, a medieval book. And it's, it's a journey, Petter, a long journey. I've been doing it a long time too. You go through many trials and troubles in this world. Depression, great suffering. 
Every point, everyone that's taken this path goes through the mill. You don't just get a yes, you can get a sort of nice answer the day you start, and uh, you know, bingo, found it. Ha ha! <laughs> Next day you get pulled down again. Fight the good fight, my friend. Stick to it. Daily practice, daily plod. You're not alone. You know, there's another old saying that came from the, 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 the man who taught me. When you've got a thorn in your foot, you take another thorn to prick, dig the first thorn out, then you throw both thorns away. So uh, that's how it is. And as long as these questions are there, you have to try and deal with them.